Dr. Alberto Toscano is a reader in critical theory and co-director of the Center for Philosophy and Critical Thought in the Department of Sociology at Goldsmiths, University of London. He's the author of three monographs, including Fanaticism on the Uses of an Idea. The title of Dr. Toscano's keynote speech is Beyond the Plague State. Hello, I'd like to begin by uh, thanking Robert Bashar and the organizers of the conference for such a generous uh, invitation to um, a really impressive um, gathering uh, and obviously a very urgent one. Uh, my talk today is entitled uh, Beyond the Plague State and uh, I'll begin. It is commonplace when commenting on crises of various stripes to notice their capacity suddenly to reveal with a seemingly smooth reproduction of the status quo leaves unremarked, to front stage or backstage, rip the scales from our eyes, and so on. The character, duration, and sheer scale of the COVID-19 pandemic is a particularly comprehensive illustration of this old and, in a sense, apocalyptic truth. From the differential exposure to death, engineered by racial capitalism, to the foregrounding of care work, from attention to the lethal conditions of incarceration, to a drop in pollution still visible to the naked eye, the revelations catalyzed by the pandemic seem as limitless as its ongoing impact on our social relations of production and reproduction. But the widespread, incessant, mediatized acknowledgement that we are living through an unprecedented crisis can also fool us into thinking that our political and ethical imaginaries are already capable of distinguishing the old from the new, that our recognition is not a misrecognition, our sight and oversight, our connaissance, um, to put it in French, a méconnaissance. The pressure that an epidemic as both reality and allegory can put on our cognitive and moral mappings is something that Albert Camus had incisively captured in his notebooks in 1942 in preparatory remarks towards the writing of the plague, a peste. I quote, develop social criticism and revolt that they are lacking in imagination. They settle down to an epic as they would to a picnic. They don't think on the right scale for plagues and the remedies they think up are barely suitable for a cold in the nose. End of quote. The imaginative blockage is arguably intensified today as pandemic conditions intersect with and are exacerbated by other social and material processes whose visibility and intelligibility are in no way transparent, not least the economic dynamics of capitalist globalization and the vicissitudes of political power. What I'm going to try to sketch out today is just an element in a broader effort to interrogate what we could call the relation between the virus, value, and violence, or epidemiology, political economy, and political theory. The political dimension of our collective life under global pandemic conditions certainly seems to abide by a crisis logic of intensification and revelation, at the same time as it's haunted by its own opacities and failures of imagination, to recall Camus. States of alarm and emergency proliferate, veritable sanitary dictatorships are spawned, most egregiously in Hungary. A public health emergency is militarized, and what the economist dubs a coronopticon is varyingly beta tested on panicked populations. Yet it would be far too simple merely to castigate the various forms of medical authoritarianism that have appeared on the contemporary political stage. Especially for those invested in preserving emancipatory futures in the aftermath of the pandemic, it is crucial to reflect on the profound ambivalence towards the state that this crisis brings to the fore. We witness a widespread desire for the state, a demand that public authorities act swiftly and effectively, that they properly resource the epidemiological frontline, that jobs, livelihoods, and health be secured in the face of an unprecedented interruption of normality, and correcting a hopeful progressive conceit whereby all repression is top down in origin there is also an ambient demand that public authorities swiftly repress those engaging in imprudent or dangerous behavior. In the unsettling words of one of the characters from Maurice Blanchot's 1948 plague novel, The Most High, Les Trésors, the sickness contaminates the law when the law cares for the sick. Given our cramped political imaginaries and rhetoric, but also I will argue the very nature of the state, this desire is overwhelmingly articulated in martial terms. Our ears grow dull with declarations of war on the coronavirus. The vector-in-chief, as Fintan O'Toole has nicely termed him in the New York Review of Books, tweets that the invisible enemy will soon be in full retreat, while a convalescent UK Prime Minister talks of, quote, a fight we never picked against an enemy we still don't entirely understand. 
Wayward nationalist analogies to the spirits of the Blitz are trotted out, while wartime legislative powers are enacted temporarily to nationalize industries in order to produce PPE or ventilators. Of course, waging war on a virus is ultimately no more cogent than waging war on a noun, i.e. terror. But it is a metaphor deeply embedded both in our thinking about immunity and infection and in our political vocabulary. As the history of the state and of our perceptions of it testifies, it is often exceedingly difficult to tease apart the medical and the military, whether at the level of ideology or of practice. Yet such, yet just as detecting the capitalist hotspots behind this crisis does not exempt us from facing up to our own complicities, so castigating the political incompetence and malevolence that is rife in responses to COVID-19 doesn't grant us any immunity from confronting our own contradictory desire for the state. The history of political philosophy can perhaps shed some partial light on our predicament. After all, the nexus between the alienation of our political will to a sovereign and the latter's capacity to preserve the life and health of its subjects, especially in the face of epidemics and plagues, is at the very origins of Western modern political thought, which, for better and very much for worse, continues to shape our common sense. This is perhaps best exemplified by a dictum coined by the ancient Roman statesman and philosopher Cicero, and then adopted in the early modern period, that is, the era of the gestation of the modern capitalist state, by Thomas Hobbes, Baruch Spinoza, John Locke, and the leveler insurgent Thomas Rainsborough. The motto goes, Salus Populi Suprema Lex, the health of the people should be the supreme law. In this deceptively simple slogan can be identified much of the ambivalence carried by our desire for the state. It can be interpreted as the need to subordinate the exercise of politics to collective welfare, but it can also legitimate the absolute concentration of power in a sovereign that monopolizes the ability to define both what constitutes health and who the people are, with the latter easily mutating into an ethnos or a race. Revisiting our political history and our political imaginaries through Cicero's slogan, rather than say, through a single-minded focus on war as the midwife of the modern state, is particularly instructive in our pandemic age. Pick up a copy of Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, 1651, and look at the famous image which likely graces its cover. In the original, that image was the frontispiece facing the title page. Uh, it was uh, drawn by uh, the engraver Abraham Boss. You will probably be transfixed by how Hobbes instructed Boss, his engraver, to depict the sovereign as a head gazing out atop a body politic composed of his subjects, all gazing inward or upward at the king. Or you might scan the landscape to observe the absence of labor in the fields and distant signs of war. One can see roadblocks, warships on the horizon, plumes of smoke coming from cannons. Or you might wonder about the icons of secular and religious power arranged on the left and right sides of the lower half of the image. What you're likely to miss is that the city over which Hobbes' so-called artificial man looms is almost entirely empty. Save for some patrolling soldiers and a couple of ominous figures, donning bird-like masks, difficult to make out without magnification. These are plague doctors. War and epidemics are the context for the incorporation of the now powerless subjects into the sovereign, as well as for their seclusion in their homes in times of strife and contagion. Salus populi suprema lex. Viewed through the prism of the state, um, viewed through the prism of uh, Hobbes' account, the state can be seen to lie between, but also combine the metaphysics of the plague and its epidemiology the people as a symbolic and iconic entity on the one hand, and the population as a viral reservoir or vector. In a recent commentary in Hobbes, the Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben, whose own editorializing on COVID-19 uh, as an opportunity for the intensification of the state of exception was met with a lot of criticism um, in his own Italy recently, Agamben nicely noticed um, in his commentary in the book Stasis that the frontispiece of the Leviathan is a powerful clue to a defining aspect of that modern state which Hobbes' thinking did so much to shape and legitimize. The absence of the people, or in Greek, ademia. Hobbes' plague doctors thus suggest a kind of secret link between, on the one hand, the absence of the people, the demos, as anything other than a multitude to be contained by and alienated into the state's sovereign, and, on the other, the periodic crises elicited by epidemics. Epidemics literally on the people, epi and demos, and pandemics, literally all the people, pan and demos. The modern state with its monopoly of power is a plague state. We could also note that it is a state of separation. Camus' notes on the plague are again suggestive where he writes, what seems best to characterize this epoch is separation. Everyone was separated from everyone else, from those they loved or from their habits. 
At the end of the plague, all the inhabitants of the city had the look of migrants. But this separation is not simple. Its political arithmetic of individualization is more insidious and productive than it might at first appear. In his lectures on the modern emergence of the social figure of the abnormal, Michel Foucault asked himself under what conditions Europe witnessed a shift from forms of rule that excluded, prohibited, and banished to techniques of power that sought to observe, analyze, and control human beings, to individualize and to normalize them. His suggestion was that we turn to the transition between two ways of dealing with infectious disease, from the politics of leprosy to the politics of plague. According to Foucault, the move away from a separation between two groups, the sick and the well, as materialized in the leper colonies or lazaretti, to the meticulous governance of the plague town, household by household, signaled a momentous shift in the governance of our behavior in general, ultimately serving as a precondition for our understanding of political power and of representation itself, of citizenship and of the state. Foucault's description of the deployment of power in a plague town bears uncanny testimony to the idea that we still largely live in the political space that emerged in 18th century Europe, in what he called the political dream of the plague. Foucault contrasted this, incidentally, to the literary dream of the plague, which was that of lawlessness and the dissolution of social and individual boundaries. So I wanted to quote a short um, passage from uh, Foucault's lectures on the abnormal. The sentries, he says, had to be constantly on watch at the end of the streets. And twice a day, the inspectors of the quarters and districts had to make their inspection in such a way that nothing that happened in the town could escape their gaze. And everything thus observed had to be permanently recorded by means of this kind of visual examination and by entering all information on big registers. It is not exclusion, but quarantine. It is not a question of driving out individuals, but rather of establishing and fixing them, of giving them their own place, of assigning places, and of defining presences and subdivided presences. Not rejection, but inclusion. You can see that there is no longer a kind of global division between two types of groups of population, one that is pure and the other impure, one that is, has leprosy and the other one that has not. Rather, there is a series of fine and constantly observed differences between individuals who are ill and those who are not. It is a question of individualization, the division and subdivision of power extending to the fine grain of individuality. End of quote. Where the enclosures of lepers operated on the stark group division between the sick, that is the contagious, and the healthy, the policing of the plague works on gradations of risk mapping individual behavior and susceptibility onto cities, territories, and mobilities. It is not a moral or a medical norm, which is at stake here, but a continuous effort to normalize the behavior of individuals, each and every one becoming the bearer of a potential threat that can only be managed through data collection, the big registers carried by the watchman. The government of the plague is thus a precursor of the political obsession with a dangerous individual, which brings together and confuses phenomena of contagion crime, or conflict, on which Foucault also was a pioneering thinker of. In the age of surveillance capitalism and algorithmic power, normalizing practices targeted at the dangerous individual accrue enormous computational force, finer and finer grain. But they are also like Daniel Defoe's narratives of self-isolation in a journal of the plague year, an increasingly voluntary affair, while the prolongation of the pandemic and its threat to individual and collective health can serve as a compelling argument, not just for the intensification of the powers of the state, but for that examination and that registering, that relativization of privacy of which Foucault's plague town was a dramatic precursor. In view of this long and deeply entrenched history of the plague state, of plague power, is it possible to imagine forms of public health that wouldn't simply be synonymous with the health of the state? Responses to pandemics that wouldn't further entrench our desire for and collusion with sovereign monopolies of power. Can we avoid the seemingly intractable tendency to treat crises as opportunities for further widening and deepening? of state powers in the absence and isolation of the people. The recent history of epidemics in West Africa has suggested the vital significance of epidemiologists thinking like communities and communities thinking like epidemiologists. While critical thinking on the profound limits of the lockdown strategy without the institution of community shields or tracking and tracing so-called move in a similar direction. Pandemics need not be thought by analogy with war as a biological argument for the centralization of power. If the post-war period, which persists as a lost object of much left melancholy, was characterized by the welfare-warfare state, the exit out of our predicament need not accept welfare as warfare as its only horizon. This is especially the case once we reflect on the profound contradictions 
now tearing at the seams of government between epidemiological and public health priorities, on the one hand, and capitalist imperatives on the other. In other words, when the health of the people and their social reproduction has been profoundly entangled with the imperatives of accumulation, the very ones determining the contribution of agribusiness to the present crisis and the dereliction of big pharma in alleviating it, the state may be intrinsically incapable of thinking like an epidemiologist. One speculative avenue for how to begin to separate our desire for the state from our need for collective health involves turning our attention to the tradition of what we could call a dual biopower, namely the collective attempt politically to appropriate aspects of social reproduction, from housing to medicine, that state and capital have abandoned or rendered unbearably exclusionary in an engineered epidemic of insecurity. Public or popular or communal or common health has not just been the vector for the state's recurrent power grab, it has also served as a fulcrum from which to think the dismantling of capitalist social forms, or social norms for that matter, and relations without relying on the premise of a political break in the operations of power, without waiting for the revolutionary day after. The brutally repressed experiments of the Black Panthers in the United States with breakfast programs, sickle cell anemia screening, and an alternative health service are just one of the many anti-systemic instances of this kind of grassroots initiative. The great challenge for the present is to think not just how such political experiments can be replicated in a variety of social and epidemiological conditions, but how they can be scaled up and coordinated while not giving up the state itself as an arena of struggle and demands. The slogan that the Panthers adopted for their, program, for their programs is perhaps a fitting counter and replacement for the Hobbesian link between health, law, and the state. Survival pending revolution. Thank you.